Good afternoon. Welcome back to the BNH virtual event space. Today, you're joining us for Like a Stories, a conversation with Lauren Wells. Lauren, welcome. Hi, Derek. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you for coming on. It's a pleasure to have you on. Look, I always love guests that are very much in line with the way I see things and and what I love about photography and people. So we're going to we're going to dive in this hour and and get into who you are as a person, a photographer. I love your work. I love the way you see the world. So I just wanted to lay that out there first and I'm going to have Danny drop some links to your Instagram, your website and an upcoming Leica Academy workshop that you have going on. So definitely check that out. And if you guys love what you hear over this next hour, which you should, you should want to go learn from Lauren more because she's not just a photographer. She's an instructor as well. So Lauren, I want to start right where we left off in the green room. You know, sometimes we have these great conversations before we go live and I just want to continue them when we go. So we were talking about trends and how we all got started and what really brought us to where we are out at as people and photographers. So you've not always been a photographer. So I want to talk a little bit about your past life. What got you interested in photography? I know this is so cliche. Tell me how you got started with photography, <laughs> but where did your photography journey start? Uh, it started in midlife. Um, I was a corporate attorney for 16 years, never had an interest in photography. Um, It was not on my radar, but funny enough, I found a journal that I wrote in college that said I wanted to take a photography class and I have no memory, but it was in there. Um, So I was uh, working at a bank in-house counsel and um, long story short, I, I didn't want to stay there. So I got kind of, uh, I asked them if they would lay me off and they did. I was a little, uh, well, did I really want that? But I got a year's severance, a year's salary. So um, I just decided to take a break, figure out what I wanted to do. And uh, I decided to go traveling on my own for six months to a few other countries. And I thought, well, I might as well learn how to take some photos. So I took this crash course uh, on the Upper West Side at the JCC. And the teacher was, she was a great photographer, uh, but she didn't know how to teach. I mean, she could, she kept getting an aperture and shutter mixed up. And she, so we in the class would just pass the book around and like, oh, that's what it is. And I don't know, I learned enough to know how to operate the camera. And I borrowed my dad's, um, he had a Rico film camera. I don't remember what model it was. And I went to some countries and I fell in love with photography, which is easy to do when you're traveling because everything's new and interesting. Mm-hmm. And um, I would show photos. I don't know how I did it because they were all um, prints, but I ended up showing photos via email. Oh, because they gave you a CD also that they scanned the photos and I would send um, the photos to my friends and thank God they didn't know anything about photography because they're like, yeah, these are great. (laughs) Oh my God, they were horrible. They were little flowers and like a cute little seal that came out of the water. And um, every now and then I got a person and I thought that was like an amazing feat. And um, I came home, uh, I got sucked back into the law uh, for five years and I could not get out of bed. I just hated going to work. So I brought my camera, I started walking to work. It was 45 minutes and I would just start taking pictures, doing street photography, not knowing I was doing street photography. Um, And that just gave me like a new spring in my step. And um, I made it through those five years. Uh, and then I discovered Cartier-Bresson and I just, I fell in love with his work and I really started to learn more about what I was doing. Um, and then five years later, I, I quit. I just couldn't take it anymore. I was having some health issues due to the stress of just not liking my job. Um, And I started photographing a friend of a friend's daughter's bar mitzvah. My brother needed help. Uh, I had to learn um, architectural photography and just little by little, I just started 
doing stuff. Um, and that was about oh, almost 20 years ago. Wow. See, so, you're proof that some people just have it because I look at I look at your work and it's like, okay, you've always, you know, always had a camera and you may not have taken it seriously your whole life, but you've always been around it. Cause generally that's what happens is you find that the talented eyes are the people that have like, oh yeah, well, I've always just kind of had a camera around and my father was a photographer and got me into it. My mother did this and that. And it's like, she inspired me. And so it's interesting to hear all that. Have you always been interested in people? Cause I know that people play a huge role. So for me personally, it's like, it's easy for me to look back and say, okay, I've always loved people watching. I studied sociology, psychology. So it's all kind of there. The, the pieces were there. What about you? I mean, working in, in as a corporate attorney, I don't know whether that makes you love people or hate people, but were you a well, people person? You're spot on. Yeah. And I am, I love people. I love watching people. I love trying to figure out what makes people tick. I'm like, everybody shrinks since I was a kid. Like all my friends have come to that. me for, and what I realized is I never, any job I got, I never really had the experience that I needed to get the job. There were always better candidates, but it was how I connected with the interviewer. And that I always tell my students now that I teach in high school there, it's more important, all those other skills than what your grades are. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really how you can relate to people. Um, I almost got fired from one of my law jobs because I had this boss who came in and he wanted to bring in his own team and I didn't fit the bill. I didn't go to the Ivy League you know, law school. And so um, I ended up getting to stay, but he hired some Ivy League lawyer and um, uh, it, it turned out he ended up promoting me over him because I had more of the the people skills and he had more of like the kind of brainy skills I think so. you see that you see that a lot I, I know my brothers told me and it's funny because my brother does hiring like corporate hiring and he deals with a lot of Ivy League candidates and he said the same thing he's like at the end of the day you can kind of tell from the first five minutes who's qualified who's not and it goes into a pool of all right can they do the job or can they not do the job and from all the people that can do the job instead of splitting hairs over you know, okay, well, this person got a 3.8 GPA and this person right. got a 3.9. He's like, it all, he's like, it's whoever's desk I want to walk by and be like, Hey, let's go grab lunch or let's get a drink after work or, you know, have a conversation within the aisle and be loud and annoy everybody else. So exactly. it's interesting that it's like, you just have that interpersonal connection and you can tell from talking to you for a couple minutes, that it's like, okay, I can talk to her. I told you when we talked on the phone, I'm like, yeah, I, this is this is cake. I love interviewing people that I would just love to have a conversation yeah. with. You're an in, you're an interesting person, and I see that you relish in that connection and and talking with people. Now, you had talked about instructing high school students, and so we have we have a little bit of a connection um, through the NYC Salt organization. For those of you who don't know about NYC Salt, definitely look it up. And Danny, let's see if we can drop a, a link to NYC Salt. They're doing great things for the underserved youth of, of New York City. And Lauren and I have both been fortunate enough to be involved in that. You're still involved in that, right? Yeah, I, I started out as a mentor. I think you were a mentor as yeah. well. And we went to some brunch. I remember you talking it up with people around you. I <laughs> was on the other never. side of the table. I never talk. <laughs> and, um, and then the next year they asked me to teach. And I said, okay, well, maybe I'll do it for a year and I'll see how, and I, it's been five years. Oh, wow. So yeah, I love it. And they, boy, do they keep me on my toes. <laughs> what, what is it about teaching and, and mentoring? Cause it's not for everybody. So what, what about mentoring? Is it that really moves the needle for you? And what do you find challenging? Um, well, first off, um, I might sound like a lawyer the way I describe this, but um, I love synthesizing information and organizing it. And I realize you can't really, you have to understand something on a deep level in order to teach it, in order to do it well. And so teaching forces me to not just know something passively, but be able to actively explain, explain it. Um, so I appreciate that. Then, um, what I love about it is whether it's a high school student or an adult that I'm teaching, 
when somebody gets it and it clicks and there's that twinkle and they feel so satisfied, it is so rewarding to see that and to see them inspired and that they can, you know, go through the next, the door, the next door that opens. Um, and what I find challenging is, first of all, everybody learns differently. And so when you have a group of students and you, I have to pay attention to psychology, you know, what, okay, that kid's asleep. Is it because of me? Is it because, you know, he's been up all night uh, studying or on his, you know, I, they text me at like three in the morning a lot. So, you know, oh, yeah. that it's just a different world. Everybody, there's no sleeping. Like when I went to bed at like 10 o'clock or even earlier when I was a kid, <laughs> um, but learning how to get through to each person and speak their language and um, also just making it interesting. It's easy to just kind of recite stuff, but you know, how do I make something fun so that people learn it that way and they're they're inspired um, to continue. So it's so, like finding finding what the angle is on everybody, mm -hmm. and it's especially I think when you find with with the youth, you've introduced something that would never had to be worried about before, and it's the distraction of technology. It's like technology is great for many things, but for the educational spectrum, it's for every positive that it presents it's like okay well how do i keep their attention because now we've been force fed this entertainment constant entertainment how do we engage with them and how do we make sure that we're getting through to them has do you think it it's more on the easy side or the difficult side with the technological aspect oh it's definitely harder i mean their attention spans and their brains are changing um and so you know the sound bite it's like, I'm not, a, I don't watch the news. I never really appreciated like the sound bite. I'd rather listen to a two hour interview to get a story, but most people never wanted to do that. But now forget it. I mean, it, you, you know, it's gotta be quick, quick, quick. So mm -hmm. I tend to be a contrarian and I, I tend to push um, at least my high school students to not necessarily sit <laughs> because sitting and staring at another computer screen when they've been sitting all day in school is not, I don't think that's helpful, but I kind of will push them, want them to get to that, like just push them a little past their, their edge to like kind of expand that attention. Um, so I'm a, I'm a bit, I'm a bit strict versus you know, I, I don't care if they like me. Um, I want them to know that I see what they're capable of. And sometimes I think, oh my God, this one, forget it. Uh, I'm definitely not her favorite. And then <laughs> by the end, you see them change. You know, teenagers, they don't reveal what's going on in there. So mm -hmm. I've stopped trying to figure it out, but pushing them. Um, to kind of expand their attention and, and just to focus a little more, even if their brains are fighting, because it's also a habit. Yeah. So habits and can be broken. I think we're, we're often really hard on ourselves and we don't see the peripheral impact of what we're doing. I know I had the, very much the same experience where it's like when I was a mentor with SALT, I was fully convinced I am not getting through. I don't know how to get through. I had so much going on in my life and it was right, right around the time when quarantine hit. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I have a baby. I've never really mentored. Salt is, is not this little startup there. It's like, Hey, we're figuring it's like, no, it's a well-oiled machine. And here I get thrown into it and you already know how all over the place I am. And then <laughs> I have a, a high school student who is like, okay, like you said, you, I might get a text a week later, like, Oh, Hey, sorry. I was busy. Um, what did you want to know again? Or what did you need? It's like, forget it. But I've seen in the years since there were students that were in that same class that I hadn't mentored that peripherally saw, oh, hey, I I love the work that you do. I see how you've, you've interacted. I saw how you were with your mentee. And I've had people that they still follow my work. They still mm -hmm. reach out occasionally. Hey, how's it going? You know, hey, I, I wanted your opinion on on an image or something like this. So it's, it is, it's, it's a validating, really cool feeling to know that you're impacting the future of the country and, and you're inspiring them. So I, I always talk about with education, you know, that, that strict 
book knowledge education where it's like, hey, I'm going to teach you technical things versus inspiring. Does that factor into the way that you educate? Is, there, is it more about inspiring them to be their own creative or to be their own person rather than saying, hey, I'm going to teach you some buttons and dials and settings and Absolutely. Um, that's one of the things at SALT that we value, um, which is why I appreciate it so much, or one of the reasons. Um, where I call it sneaking the vegetables in the dessert. So we're teaching you photography, but we're really trying to teach you confidence and building community and that your voice really matters. I mean, it took me a long time to realize that I mean, photographers are a dime a dumbest a dozen, let's face it. And I started this later in life and I was just so intimidated by, well, how am I, uh, how, where is this space for me? And what I realized is we, each one of us really is unique and we have something to say because it, we're the only ones who think that way or articulate that way or what have you. So um, seeing the the photography is kind of the residual or through photography mm -hmm. they are learning so much more about themselves and the world and um inspiring them that is what i think is the biggest challenge because the i think the only thing i can do uh i learned this is instead of trying so hard to inspire what inspires me because that's an energy that really comes out mm -hmm. so i can't fake it um, and, um, and knowing that the teacher cares, like they know whether you care or not, they may not, it may take a little negotiating here and there, but, um, just kind of taking that each one aside, it's always the quiet ones who have so much in there that you just don't know until you connect with them maybe outside of class or they have the courage to ask a question and seeing something in them finding that thing that they didn't even know was in there and that they connect to and that there, there's a light that lights up and i don't care i always say i don't care if you ever pick up a camera again after this class but i want you to leave with something about yourself that you feel inspired by. And that's really for anything I teach, not just at salt, but that's, yeah, I think that's a human thing that we're all looking for. Definitely. So what does inspire you either as a person or as a, as an artist? Oh God, how would I put this in uh, so many things? I mean, I'm passionate about so many things. First of all, it makes no sense to photography, but people who know me will laugh. I love speaking Spanish. Like it is one of my deepest <laughs> passions. And um, so I only watch stuff on TV, like on Netflix or on in Spanish. People say, have you seen that show? Is it in Spanish? No, I've never seen it. Um, so doing that, I love music. I'm a very frustrated guitar player. Um, well, I'm not a guitar player. I've had a guitar for 30 years and uh um, but I'm still inspired to pick it up and practice. You're working on those 10,000 hours. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe in the next life I'll, I'll get to that. <laughs> um, I love people. And I think that's what, you know, we were talking about at the start and before we, we went live, um, just observing and seeing the commonality in someone. Cause I don't know, the world's a little crazy. Um, and I, I grew up kind of asking myself questions. I just don't understand the world. Like we go to school, we're supposed to get good grades in order to go to college, in order to get a good job, to, um, have a family and pay the bills. And then do, then they're going to, we're training them to do the same thing. And like that, there's no life in that. And at least for me and, I, at a young age, kind of felt that. And I said, there's got to be something else. And so there was that burning thing. I guess it's in your soul that everybody has, and it's just how you listen to it or not. I didn't know that it was a voice. I didn't know what it was saying. But um, 
just connecting to that. And what I realized it's simple things like there are days I just, I don't bring my camera uh, anymore with me and I'll just watch people, New York City's the best place. People wear their lives in public and mm -hmm. you can have the most incredible five minutes, 30 seconds with people. Um, and I, I get really inspired by uh, just meeting new people, observing them, seeing what they have to say. Um, I love meditation. I mean, we, I could go on and on, but maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to look at some of your work later. And I, and I said this again before we went live, but you have a beautiful eye. And I think the one thing that jumps out about your, your street photography. And again, I'm going to use that very loosely. I think, I feel like you're on the same page as me where it's like, I don't want to be branded a street photographer, maybe in the past, maybe I called myself that because I felt like we have to put a box around ourselves. That's how we're forced right. to feel where it's like, well, you can't just be a photographer. Well, yeah, you can. I, you just right. like taking pictures of what you see. And, and for those of you who have not yet looked at Lauren's work, click on her website. One of the things that jumped out to me, and it was interesting when you, when you said earlier that, you know, you had to learn to take architectural photos. And it's like, I instantly, when I saw architectural on your website, I went there because I love, and that's been, you know, for people who know me, I love working in architecture into my street photos. And mm. whenever I see anything, I like shapes and I love lines and just architecture in general is interesting to me. So in seeing that, it's like, well, I don't care if it's street photography because I'm not in someone's face with a flash and I'm looking right. up at a building and I love the way that the clouds sit behind a pattern. So I see that in your work that there's always layers to it. And your work looks to me like the kind of work that you can't print it small. A phone doesn't do mm. it justice. It has to be seen large. It has to be seen printed. It's the kind of work that when you see people at museums just standing up and staring at, at a painting, that's how I see your work because there's so much going on. And as you were just talking about your love of just life and, and people and people watching, I see that in your images. I see someone that's content to sit there and just observe and capture because through that moment, you're able to relive that moment over and over and over. And you can look at a picture a million times and every time you're going to see something that you might not have seen before or something you didn't particularly see at the, at the time. But at the same time, there's so much intentionality in your work. And, and again, we'll, we'll discuss this when we, when we look at your work, but it's like you have a, a subject, a clear subject in the foreground. And in the background, there's another subject. It's something that some people might find the power there. Some people might look way in the background and see something else. And it's just the way that you you piece things together that I really love. And, and I can really see you're just somebody who appreciates a moment and appreciates, like what you said, we, we go in this track of school, more school, more school. For some people, they go to extra school. And then for what? You know, you, you go to school to pay your bills to then die. And when do we really enjoy life? And your images, I think, for me, are an appreciation of just everyday life. Fair to say? Oh, yeah, it was just so spot on. Can you be my agent, please? <laughs> <laughs> I'll write your press releases. Okay, thank you. Well, sometimes it's easier for someone else to um, sum up your work than you can. Mm -hmm. And um, you hit on a lot of things. First of all, you mentioned architecture and how that informs a lot of your images. When I see, I see shapes. The first thing I see, and there's an architecture to that. It, the bodies are, there's a line, there's a, there's a circle in the shape that it's, so I'm looking at everything on the street as a prop, like a stage. And then you have the main character and, and finding that main character is, that's where the, the gold is. And that, I mean, I might get one shot in a month. That's really something um, because finding that that moment um with all the supporting characters around that's what I'm kind of yeah that's I don't even know if I'm looking for it but that's what I see interesting if that makes sense you're, you're present and when something presents itself it's it's almost like you're not forcing yourself you're not really going out there with as much as you're going out there to take images 
you're not you're going out there to just see and and immerse yourself and if you see something you like or you see something start to come together you're there to capture it and seize the moment well you know i do that now and but i used to hunt i mean it was and there was an a, there was this adrenaline which a lot of people like the adrenaline rush i am a calm person i don't like that I hate speed in cars. I I'm just, so it would get me anxious, but I felt like, oh, I gotta, I gotta get something. It was, it was feeding something. And it it kind of burned me out a little bit. Um, and when the when the pandemic came, like I just stopped completely. I was really happy to stop. Um, first of all, I didn't see anything out there um that was inspiring me during that time. But um, but now it's such a different um it's it's a different engagement like you you hit it on head it's just i don't need to prove anything to myself which is really what it was about like mm -hmm. it's if i see something um great and if not i still had a great time because if i'm out there just looking around there's nothing better than this theater in this city mm -hmm. or anywhere if you know i'm visiting somewhere else do you feel there's a pressure on us? You know, we talked, you talked about going out there and hunting. Do you feel that there's pressure with the way that photography and social media? I mean, we look at, we have 24 hour news. We're constantly being force fed everything, all types of media and content in general. Do you feel that that's affected the way us particularly, I'm just going to put the stamp back on just for, for argument's sake, street photographers, people who are going out and, and photographing everyday life. Do you feel that there's been pressure you know, this, I have to be present every day. I have to post, I have to give people something. It's like, like a little like hamster water bottle where you got the dropper has to stay on. Do you feel that that's played into whether consciously or subconsciously, how much we as photographers feel we have to produce and. Um, I'm not sure. I'm sure there's a little of that around for sure with all the social media stuff, but I'm thinking of the people I know um, and a lot of them have to go out and shoot whether or not, I don't, I don't know about their thoughts about posting, but some of them just have to do it. It's like breathing. They mm. just, that's who they are. And then others, I think use it as a discipline. I have to be out there. It's like exercising. I got to go do this to exercise that muscle. And I get that. And I, I used to do a lot of that. And it also makes you better photographer because you're out there doing it all the time. But I've just taken a step back and I'm like, you know what? None of this is serious brain surgery stuff. Like I'm, I'm just, I don't care anymore what I'm supposed to do about anything. And, um, or at least I try not to. Uh, and it's been so freeing. Um, and I'm rarely on social media. Cause I just, I have, I want to use my time in another way. And just seeing everybody with this, it, you know, gets you anxious. Like it's boom, 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 boom. And, um, you need to so, mentor me, get hmm? me off. Of, you need to mentor me, get me off of social media. <laughs> yeah. Maybe <laughs> you, I should learn you, what I did and then mentor people. Cause this just kind of happened. Yeah. I mean, that seems like the right approach you're, you're driven by. And I, and I love that where the pressure isn't coming from that. And that's such a great and refreshing thing to hear where it's just, yeah, this need to go out and shoot. And I totally get that. And I, and I love, I don't know if you know, Mike Peters, Mike Peters just posted an image and it was like, you know, it, it totally resonated every once in a while. I read something and I'm like, I really felt that. And it was basically about how he's not the guy that will see the the crazy happenstance moments on the street and the juxtapositions and all the stuff that we've come to associate with street photography and great photographers. It's like, okay, you have a, a, a lady whose wig blows off and it looks like a cloud and it's right <laughs> next to, a, you framed it right next to a cloud in the sky. And it's like, oh my God, we, we, I think we've associated that as like this amazing photography sure. and this is what you should strive for. And if you don't take photos like that, then you're not worth your salt. So I, I love that. It's like, yes, I totally get seen going out and just feeling like, like the people who need to exercise every day to feel alive and, and to really live their life. So it's, it's refreshing that it's like, that's what 
you know, that's what can drive people. And, and if that's what drives you and moves you to, to get out, because I feel like we, we put so much undue pressure on ourselves. I feel like oh that could be a healthy God. pressure, you know, to, to keep your creative juices flowing, because again, it's about enjoying life, right? We want to sure. enjoy the ride. Sure. Right. The key is to enjoy and to be able to relax. Um, yeah. So, well so where from here, I mean, is there anything that you have set in, in, your mind as far as what does success look like? What is as far as 10 years down the line? Is this something that, you know, have you set up goals for yourself as far as, hey, I want to do this or, you know, I've done this, I've done this, this is next? Um, well, I'm not much of a goal person. Um, I just kind of like, I, I know what I love and I just kind of put it out there and then doors sort of open little by little. And I just walk through and I'm like, oh, wow, look, I guess that was a goal kind of semi-consciously um the one goal that i have uh is i did a um uh, a six-year personal project on the game of stickball in uh east harlem and in the bronx and i absolutely fell in love with these people why because they were so passionate about this game and and the electricity it was it was the people they they um one guy got, they have this hall of fame where they, the best players get inducted into the hall of fame and, and they call up this guy, uh, Juan, I forgot his last name, but like Juan Gomez and the person, uh, and he, and this guy comes up and picks up the, the award. And then afterwards, somebody comes up to him and says, oh my God, your name is Juan. I've known you for 25 years. You you're lefty. Everybody has a nickname. And so when they get onto the field, they have this other life that they don't really know about the life outside of this. I mean, some of them do because they, you know, they're, they're friends outside. But I mean, it was just this. So I did this uh, project and I really want to create a book and, and give it back to them. Um, but I don't even, when that will happen, I don't know. But that is something I have to do uh, within the next, hopefully, five years. I love that. I was just about to ask him, like, where can we see this project? It sounds like something I would love. So, yeah, um, I, you know, looking and I don't want to do it. I don't want to cater to photographers, make it a photography book. I want to mm -hmm. cater to sports or stickball or, uh, you know, older people who used to play it as a kid or so. I'll keep you posted. So just, yeah, maybe keep whispering in my ear because I can just let a year go by without. I'm going to, I'm going to be on you about that. Cause I would love to see it. I, I, like I said, your work is the work that needs to be printed and seen. I don't say that about everybody's work. I think I'm a pretty, pretty particular person. And, but your work has that je ne sais quoi, the, just this quality where I'm, you just, it, printing would do it justice. And I would love to see, I, I think, everybody should print their work. I mean, if you, if you don't look at photo books to at least just keep you, I don't look at photo books to say, wow, I want to take photos like this. I don't want to take photos like this. Like I see the eyes of the city behind you. I have it right to the oh, left. Yeah, yeah. Richard Sandler, one of the greats. <laughs> yes. um, I, I look at, you know, I'll look through the eyes of the city and I'll be like, wow, I need to go out and shoot more. I need right. to print more. So that's, that's, I'm going to stay on top of you with that because I would love to see that, um, you know, Ira Block loves baseball as well. Everybody knows Ira Block, the, the Nat Geo photographer, he's a huge baseball fan. He has the, you know, his, his Cuba baseball book. And I look through that and it's like, cause I'm a huge baseball fan. Right. So as I, my son's gotten older and he's taken an interest in baseball, we look through Ira's book, we go to Yankee games. So it's cool. It's like, you know, Ira and I were at a Yankee game together and I had my son there and to introduce him. And it's like, oh, this is the guy that made the book about baseball. Oh, in Cuba. And it's like, he's six years old. So he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's <laughs> in his head, he's like, who, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? But um, all that to say, yes, I'm, I'm going to make sure that, that you get it done. Cause I think that's what's, that's where the power is. That's how you inspire. And there's so many, so many people that are inspired going back to this whole conversation of you don't know who's looking at your work. You don't know who's paying right. attention. We've, we've increasingly tied validation to these tangible aspects. If you don't mm. click like on an app 
on my image, you don't like it. And right. I hate it. It's like, I, why can't people just look at stuff and be inspired? I'm sure Richard Sandler has no, no idea how many times I look through his right. book and I'm like, oh my God, this, this man makes me want to go out into the streets every single day and quit my job and, right. you know, and <laughs> do what you're doing. Hey, I love my job. I yeah, you got it. a great one. Don't worry, don't worry. I'm not leaving. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, I don't know where that long diatribe was going, but I want to, I want to dig into some images cause I love your work okay. man, and, and I want to show oh, the people. You. So this is just going to be a nice little easy pass through. Don't feel obligated to, uh, pull out anything. We, you know, we're going to look through these images and if there's anything that jumps out, I love this image right here. And please go check out Lauren's work. I can't say this enough because there's some images that we we can't show because we're a modest family channel, but mm. nothing too crazy, <laughs> but uh, we keep it very modest here. But um, this image right here, when, when I looked through, this is one of my favorites. How can, can you just talk about, because this is one thing that a lot of people either don't get if they're not used to photographing on the street, or it's one thing that's always asked to me about how do you stand there and take an intentional photo and you're really like you're facing down the barrel of a gun most times in New York City you're you're looking and it's like it it's very daunting so mm -hmm. in regards to this image or in particular in general uh talk us through it well this one was an easy one in that regard um because well, so first off, I saw the shapes. That's all I saw. And then my brain is like, okay, is this interesting? And so I put the camera up to my eye and they saw me and they were, they were giving me tacit consent because they're telling him to turn around. And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, don't look, this is perfect. <laughs> and he was so stubborn. I mean, I probably took five shots, which you know is a lot when you're passing by. And thank God he didn't turn around. But that you know, if you look at it, what's going on, you can relate to that moment where where you're an adult saying, smile, turn around. And so it's those human moments that we've all we all are familiar with. Um, so here's the stage, and there's all the props, and everything's in place. You've got your circles and your 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 lines, your vertical lines, your horizontal lines with this kid in between the, the bench. Um, and then you've got the moment and, you know, his hands, if we couldn't see his hands like up on there, like, I don't know if it would have been as good a photo, but it's that we don't need to know what they're saying to know what's going on. And that's another thing about photography. You know, you're not telling the whole story, you're telling enough to be able to deduce what actually happened or take it in your own direction. That's even more exciting when people like have a different story because they've had a different experience. I love this. This this is exactly, it proves my point earlier. It's like I could cut the feed right now and, and it would feel perfectly validated that everything is just all come together. It, everything is right here. Like it's just such a beautiful frame. And it's one that every time you look at it and the more you look at it, I see new things, whether it's the Ninja Turtles on the the goodie bag buckets or the, you know, smiling, facing the camera. Oh. And the only person not facing the camera is the kid. And like you said, the hands up there, even like the the shirt off the shoulder is like a typical, it's, it's a kid thing. There's just so many elements to this that I love and that work together. And I'm, I'm glad I, I had you figured properly when I look at your work on my own, because it's like, I totally see all the shapes and how much composition really plays into your work. Oh, so this was lucky. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Coney Island where I, I you know did a I spent a lot of summers going there and I did a little project on that. Um and everybody was leaving. It was getting stormy. Uh and I saw the birds and I saw the thunderbolt and I saw the clouds. And I took the picture and then I got home and I, no, like, what? There's a lightning bolt? I did not see that when I took the picture. I love so, it. You, you were so in the moment. Now, I, I got to take this moment. And I know, hey, it's b &H. I can mention gear and people won't sure. throw, uh, throw bricks at me. Uh, what do you what do you film with? How did how did you come to Leica? Which particular Leica system is it that you that you use when you're out photographing? 
Um, I mainly use the, the Q2. Um, I just started with the M11 now. So how I came to Leica is an interesting story. <laughs> um, I uh, was, at, do you know the Miami Street Photography Festival? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I work for them. And um, one year we were down the night before the festival was starting and there's there used to be a Leica, um, Leica used to sponsor it actually. So um, there was a an open, it may have been Richard Sandler's opening. I'm not sure though, um, at the Leica Gallery in Coral Gables and there are a bunch of people and I had a Fuji camera and there are a bunch of people in it. We're all in a circle talking photographers and they're all Leica users. And the day before one of the Leica people had come up to me and said, oh, you use Fuji. Well, we can offer you a 17% discount. And I'm like, thank you very much. And then in this little circle while we're talking, I said, you know, with all due respect, I know Leica is supposedly a great camera. I mean, I know it is. Uh, and um, and I love that you guys are all so passionate about it, but I just want you to know, and I said this to the Leica person who works at Leica, uh, I was just offered a 17% discount on a, you know, $5,000 camera that <laughs> I'm a freelance photographer in New York city that just, I am not your market. And I'm really happy with my Fuji. And I'm glad, I just want to find people just as passionate to talk about the camera I have, but who cares? We're all making nice pictures. And he came over to me afterwards. And I guess it was sort of like a, um, uh, he just, he wanted, it was like a goal for him. He wanted to get a, a Leica in my hand. So I was doing stickball at the time. And he said, look, we'll loan you a camera to shoot stickball. And because of the, I was only able to use it for one day. But, and I, long story, but I used it for one day along with my Fuji and my Canon cameras that I would carry to stickball because I had all these, you know, longer lenses. And I used it didn't think anything of it at the time. And a few months later, I look at the photos from that one day and the Leica images literally, they popped off the screen. And I said, oh, <laughs> this is not, this is true. Like, uh oh. And so then they loaned it to me to shoot more of stickball. And a, a little bit after that, they asked me to if I would join them in teaching for the academy. So that is how I, I was not looking for it, didn't care. And that's when things happen when, you know, when you just don't care. <laughs> totally, totally. And it's always great to hear everybody's origin story because as much as we say the gear doesn't matter and it doesn't, it does. We have a tie to our gear. It's, it's a personal sure. extension of our work. And we have to, we have to use gear that we feel connected to and that we feel presents our vision because that's what it is we're we're presenting our view of the world and we want it to be presented in a way that we feel is is best represented so yeah. I, it's you know when i ask people what gear they use it's like i always cringe inside because i'm like but it's again it's like we talked about earlier why do i care what anybody else thinks i think it is important for people to see and hearing something like that where it's like you're not really you know, you know that it's not the f the camera that makes or breaks your images. You're right. the one that ultimately creates it. You see it, right? But at the same time, you want something that you want to carry around that yep. you want to create images with. So, I'm I'm glad to hear that origin story. It's equally as entertaining as it is informative. Yeah, and and Gilles Perez once said to me, um, he uh, he said, "Do you do you like your camera?" I, and I was using a well, it doesn't matter what I was using at the time, but I said, oh, it's fine. He's Lauren, you really need to love your camera. And I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> and, <laughs> and now I can appreciate that. Yeah. I love that. So, so yeah, again, I'm looking at the shapes and uh, I was able to take a lot of this one. It's always a gift when you can really work a scene because their backs were towards me. They all knew I was photographing. The parents knew nobody cared. Um, and it's, I love sh photographing children. I didn't know how much until someone pointed it out. And it makes sense because I absolutely love children. Like they're just, they're full of passion in life. 
And so they, they inspire me just what the, you know, they don't wear any masks and they're just, they're honest. So this is kind of like that Norman Rockwell thing to me. And um, I, I just love photographing joyous moments or if, if you would call it that. Um, but I, you know, I had to wait till he put his hands up or else you know, all the other pictures were just not good because you got to get that shape for the silhouette. I love it. I love it. it this is one of the ones that jumped out. It's, ah. So I, it, it's funny because I didn't know that this was a decent picture until I was TAing for a print, uh, black and white print class at ICP. And um, the teacher said, hey, um, you, you know, you feel free to, you can convert your work. We had to convert to black and white and then print. Feel free to bring your stuff and you can work in the class. And I have probably 50 shots of this scene and there was with another boy who was weight and kind of out of breath, hanging on the bar, looking up at the big buff guy. And to me, it was like that story of the kid, like, oh, I wish. And so I was, you know how we can get emotionally attached to our images. That was the image for me. And I was converting that one. And he saw this one and um, I don't know, it was on my screen and he said, hey, I think you should probably do that one. I said, oh, no, no, thanks, thanks. I'm, I'll, I'll do that another time. And a couple of weeks later, I was like, oh my God, what was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> but you sometimes you really need someone else to look at your work. Um, sometimes, no matter how long it is, you, you just can't be objective about it. So yeah. it could be so hard to, to because it is our work and it's it's so hard sometimes to say no i no one knows what i see and what i want to see like i do but right. there's times and, and again like you said you're pot committed because it's your images that personal connection you show it to and now i haven't seen the other image now now you're making me want to see the other image. no but this I, one's better <laughs> I, I look at this one and there's so much to it and there's not just so much to it to love but the way it's the little nuances, it's the, you know, the, the guy that's hanging from the, uh, you know, the guy hanging on the right, I forget what they, what they call that, uh, that move there. The oh, you know the what the move is. Oh, wow. I'm some, impressed. <laughs> there's, there's some, it's called like, like the flag or something where you, you know, that's the wow. thing. That's the, that's the ultimate test of entire Sweet. upper body strength is being able to hold yourself up like a flag and the way he's right above the horizon. Yeah. And it's funny when you said that, you know, with the kid hanging on the bar, looking up at the big buff guy, I see that here with the skinny kid. You have the little, right. for lack of a better word, scrawny. I was scrawny my whole life. I can use it. <laughs> um, the, the scrawny kid looking at the guy doing the knuckle push-ups in the sand. And it's looking like, yeah, it, there's like this, I want to be that the girls in the background and just everything going on. Uh, you know, the, the seagull in this, everything. Yeah. There's so much here. So much. Yeah, you're right about that kid. I did, and when I saw the scrawny guy, I said, "Oh, okay. There, here's another story. I'm okay with this one." But it took yeah, me a while. No, every, <laughs> everything comes together in it. This another. Yeah. I, I just again, I love, I love the way you frame your images, and I, I see the shapes, the lines. I see a lot of like this is how I see the world. So I really resonate. Oh, I love me. that. <laughs> Kindred photo photographer. Uh, Definitely. Spirits. Definitely. Um, I was on my way to stick ball. So, you know, there's that, there's that uh, cliche that says always be ready. Um, so I usually have my gear in like this little wheeler, tiny little bag that on wheels uh, for stick ball. And, but I always kept my, um, uh, you know, my street camera, which, you know, 28 millimeter um, on me and uh, ready. And he, I didn't even know. I thought, wait, is he pretending not to see? No, he was playing hide and seek. So That's when funny. I got, there's another kid I and they were like it. counting. So that made it even more special. Um, and I wish I could find him because I'd love to give his family this, but uh, so if you on East 110th Street, um, let me know. There you go. You, you know, Lexander. one thing I love about this image is, and this is what I think separates great photographers from people who are lost or don't really 
know their 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 place and and the right side of the image, right? The book shot, the book drop, the New York Public Library. I look at how many people. I look at a lot of images. I critique a lot of Im images. I talk to a lot of people about their images, and little details like that where people would be like, "Oh, okay, well, you know, I would cut that off. I'd I'd crop off the whole book drop thing," and they wouldn't even look at the. They're they're just looking at like, "Oh, I want a nice clean edge on that wall," and I can't see the whole. I love that it places it, and uh, again to reference a, a another great street photographer, Matt Weber. Mm, Remember yeah. him talking about one of his images, and I have to do it and not in his voice because every time I think about <laughs> it, every time I think of a Weber quote, I hear his voice. Um, shout out to Matt, love you, love you, Matt. And he's he had posted an image from the '80s in New York, and he's like don't remember where it was he's like I, I, I wish I took a picture on the on the the, uh, the sign the street sign he's like so I knew where to cross street he's like because it doesn't look the same now I don't recognize it and I wish I knew where it was wow. and little details book drop of the New York Public Library if you if that's not there if you cropped it out if you frame this image differently you lose that and 30 years from now you might not remember where this image is a hundred years from point. now, somebody might have no idea where this was. And a little detail like that adds so much that I feel like it, it's underrated how important that is, the little details that can simply place or geotag an image. So I just wanted to throw that in there. I don't even know if it was a thought in your mind, but I love, I love pointing out what I see in an image because, again, Matt probably has no idea that I reference that hmm. little thing and it was just like him in an instagram caption being matt but i think of it all the time when i go to frame an image and i'm like i used to always cut certain things out and i'm like no i'm gonna leave that in because i remember matt 35 years after he took the image wanting to remember where the image was taken and because he didn't have a little identifier wasn't able to place it yeah that is insightful i i never thought of it that way i did like that it it acts as a it's a bookend, no pun yes. intended. And there's a photographer who I really respect. And he told me, oh, that he would have cropped that out. And then I said, well, to me, that's an opinion now. We talked earlier that there, when you're when you're starting out and you're getting critiqued, usually it's about those rules, like you got a cactus grown out of the subject's head, watch that stuff. And those to me are facts. And then there's, this is to me an opinion, that's his opinion and mine is what it is and I'm sticking to it and I'm comfortable with it. And I never thought about what you said, but that is, uh, makes a lot of sense. I, I'm facts and opinions. That whole conversation we had earlier is getting com committed. One day I'm going to be talking about the time that I interviewed Lauren Wells and, and, and you know, we talked about that fact versus opinion, because I think that's <laughs> such an awesome way to look at things where, and for those of you, let me, let me just, while, while you guys absorb this image here, it's another great image. Before we went live, Laura and I were talking about, you know, you hit a certain point where it's like, okay, yes, facts versus opinions. You have a cactus growing out of your head, as Lauren mentioned. And okay, yes, factually, yes, there's a, now you, you early on in your career, you might be, okay, well, I can't do that. And then you might hit a point where you're, you know, there's certain rules that you can bend or break, or you don't just simply care about because you like an image or you see something in the image. And I think that's a powerful stance in being an artist where you kind of cement yourself as I know who I am. I know what my vision and what my voice is. And I don't care what rules are perceived rules or not. It violates. Yes, it might be factual, but fact versus opinion. I love that. Now, this, I, I love it. Another image that I just completely love. Uh, there's a good story behind this one too. Um, so I, again, I see, I see the layers. I see this girl through, you know, sitting on the steps and I go, I raise the camera to my eye and this girl with the arms connected to her uh, decides to push this girl away. And I think she thought that this girl was in getting in the way of my photo and i was gonna i was so pissed <laughs> you, do you get that way when they're, they're destroying you're the director they're oh destroying my God, yes. your scene yes don't walk on my set 
Uh, so that's where meditation comes in really handy. But um, I was so pissed. And this is a, that other cliche, never delete your photos in camera ever, ever, ever. And then I realized, oh my God, it's so much better because it has this, it breaks the pattern. It's not so static and it gives it this energy and this kind of, uh, you know, quirkiness, or you can kind of, it's a different story with that in there. Totally. It, and again, like I always find myself now saying with your images, I look at the little things, the New York City up in the top uh, left oh, corner on yeah. the shorts. And it's like the girl on the right with the Jordans, the girl on the left with the Jordans. And I think that's such like, oh, a, I never noticed that. It's a oh, cultural yeah. like New York City and Jordans. And I feel like maybe this is me being a, a recovering sneakerhead, but it's like you look at <laughs> whatever model Jordans, whichever colorway. And you kind of base where we are, you know, I love, I love things that break down where in on the timeline we are. And, and that's one of the things that has become something, especially in, in urban environments is mm. what model Jordans are we bringing back into the fold right now? And is there a new colorway or is it a classic? And so it's, it's little things like that. It's obvious the framing and, and I love the hand in there. And it's, I think the hand totally makes the image. It's funny as, as much as it, she was, you know, inserting herself into your set. She became a powerful co-star to what, what's going on there, which I think is Absolutely. awesome. Absolutely. Universe was on my side there. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, I love this girl. Uh, this was up in East Harlem after a stickball game. There was a uh, uh, some festival going on and uh, they all knew I was there and they didn't care. So they were just ignoring me, um, which is, that's the best kind you can get because you can spend as long as you want in you know theory and I don't have to worry. So, um, and you know, the, that in certain cultures are easier to photograph and the Latin culture is a little more open. So, uh, you know, in general. Um, and yeah, just that mug on her. Um, is my favorite, but these are all, that's the supporting cast around her yeah. on the stage. And I love how everyone, you know, we, we talk all the time about how cameras have played into culture where, you know, when you went from the film days to now, everybody has cameras, we're more comfortable around cameras and better in some ways. And in some ways people are, they're more guarded because now photos are everywhere. But I love how in these images, everyone is it's there the guard is down which i think is a true sign of comfortability and that presents such a better synopsis of of what we're looking at here you're looking at life you're not looking at something mm. that's staged and posed and you don't it doesn't have to be one of these things where it's like okay everybody don't mind me i'm here it's just kind of like you're immersed in the environment which i always think make think makes the the best most genuine images uh, this was, so this was fairly easy or this wasn't hard to take because, um, the guy on the right, putting his hand on the shoulder of this woman, they're singers. So they, you know, they come through the car singing gospel or whatever they're singing. So they think I'm photographing them. So this guy who's the star is, first of all, he's got his earphones in. He probably didn't even know I was there, but I, position my body so it looked like I was photographing them anyway um and you know then there's just these little details that uh you know you see in the back left through the window this there's a someone doing this guy's hair and it's it's the hands I mean it's a it's a small thing but everyone with the hands I mean he's touching his hair um her with the pencil in her hand in her hair and then his with the lollipop but for me, what this is about is in New York City, we wear our lives in public. I mean, he's getting dressed in public and he doesn't care because we don't have that kind of space. So that's, you know, oh, and then on the, the poster, the, the poster, woman with the hands yeah. on the shoulders. Yeah, that, I think that's all subconscious stuff. I don't know if I'm conscious of all that while it's going on. I, I think... Part of it is the universe sees that it's like mm. she would she would have done this. 
we're, we're gonna we're gonna throw one here and i think it is you just the way you see and there's so many things being fired off i think in your brain that you're, you're seeing it you might not be able to slow it down to realize you are right but it's all kind of there I, I saw the same thing and it's like again i love when my eyes and brain are taken around an image because one thing leads me to another leads me to the next and it's like even even the expressions it's like even though they're singing there's still this stoic look everybody's mm. face that you can see in this image has kind of just the stoic blank look the only smiles in the image are on the <laughs> ad which is a it's not a happy ad even though it says you know you're bringing back mom's smile but it's talking about long-term illness right. which is not a pleasant thing and that's the only smile so just yeah, i don't know so little ironic. things like that yeah is, oh you're you're good Maybe, yeah. look, maybe it, I, 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 sometimes I read way too deep into things, but I think that's what, that's what this is for. That's what photography, you know, when yeah. you talk kind of circling back as we're, we're getting ready to tie this whole thing up here is it's appreciating life and it's mm -hmm. being able to freeze a moment of time and sit here and talk about it. And the fact that we can sit here and talk about a moment that was gone like that and really point out these things and see and it's that's what the beauty is that's where the value is that's why photography will never be a passing trend no matter what trends pass through it you know photography itself will never be a passing trend so i i uh want to thank you for this past hour lauren i wish we could sit here and look at your images all day now can now you got me on I, I want to clear my schedule the rest of the day. Just keep talking and looking at images. Just, I would uh, love you to look at my images because you're finding things that I've never seen. <laughs> you get me excited about them all over again. Yeah, look, this was this, awesome. No, this this was great. I I, I don't even think, you know, I, I knew it was going to be great talking and, and chopping it up with you, but I don't even think I imagined it to be like this. Ah, I love when I when I leave an interview or talking with somebody and you just really feel like there are other people out there who are just as passionate about it's just like that wholesome love for appreciating the moment and wanting to document every moment. You know, I, sometimes I feel like, uh, like a dork, the way I'm so evangelical about talking about photography, like the power of the moment, capture it. And I look at your work and it's like perfect validation. It's you can, you can beautifully capture life in a way that makes you want to revisit everyday moments. I think you've really seized on that whole, you talked earlier about Cartier-Bresson and, you know, the decisive moment is one of the things that was, was so precious and, and what he's probably best known for in, in the minds of a lot of people starting out who hear about him, but it's those everyday moments. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to always be a decisive moment. It's finding beauty in the everyday moment and finding those puzzle pieces in everyday life whether it's shapes or people staggered or layering that is just so beautiful in your work. I love the way you see, I love the way you see the world. And I think whether it's through your eyes or through your camera, it's just beautiful the way you see things. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Well, oh, thank you, Derek. That's that passion that you exude about this work that we do. Um, that's what makes this, that's what makes street photography so interesting. It's the passion for life. So, yeah, I really appreciate that. Well, Lauren, this has been a pleasure. It's like, I don't want to hang up. We have, Danny, do we have to end? <laughs> oh, let me just tell you, can I just? <laughs> yes, yeah, yes. Oh. I, you got me so like in the zone. I'm like, yes, the the, the floor is yours. Uh, I just want to um, give a shout out to Leica Academy because we are having a uh, a workshop. I'm giving a two day uh, workshop in uh, August 12th and 13th here in New York, um, learning how to see. And we're gonna be in Manhattan and Coney Island. So love for any of you listening to join us and um, we'll have an adventure and find your voice. I love it. Yes, I will second second that. Please look, not only support our artists that we that we bring on for you guys, but help yourself out, invest in yourself. And when you see a photographer that truly sees the way Lauren sees, it should make everybody want to go out and see the world like that. Cause it's not just about taking great images. It's about the journey and appreciating the journey. And I think nobody has driven that home better than you have Lauren with your images. It's the way you see the way you appreciate life. We all should. That's, that's what it's about. So 
I will leave it there, everybody. I, I don't know how I'm going to function the rest of it. I might just have to mail it in. Danny, take over the reins. I'm, I'm calling it in for the rest of the day. I'm, I'm going out on a high note. Lauren, thank you so much. Thank you. you. To... Thank you. We, yes, we definitely, we gotta, we gotta rekindle. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll uh, hit up the old, I'll hit up the salt crew and be like, when's the next brunch I'm crashing? Yeah, come. I know. All I right. gotta swing by. Well, Lauren, look, I think this was the prompting I need. Well, let's, let's stay in touch. And uh, I, it's, you're doing great things. Well, uh, I'll make sure I stay on top of you about that, that stick ball book. And uh, a huge thank you to all of our viewers out there. I know we did have one question come in. You know what? If I can, if I can take one more minute, because I always love to, whenever we have our viewers engage, um, Linda, who's joined us here and been patiently waiting on Zoom, had a question about black and white versus color. Do you ever shoot in color? Oh, uh, Linda. <laughs> I always shoot in color, except when I'm using a like a monochrome. So, uh, and I convert, I convert to black and white, two reasons. One color to me, it's, it's a subject and my brain, although I can see all those layers, it's too much information for me. So, um, I, I get rid of it. Um, and so just to kind of accent the characters, uh, and their shapes and stuff like that. Uh, I, so I always shoot in color, um, except when I'm using a monochrome, but do I keep it in color, um, for my street photography? Rarely every now and then there's a photo that just has to be in color, but black and white is my, the way I see. Perfect. Well, Lauren, huge. Thank you again. Uh, the, the entire Leica team. John, Richard, everybody over at Leica who's uh, made this possible. Huge thank you for them and all their support of what we're doing here. Yeah, they um, rock. <laughs> they are awesome. They really are awesome. So thank you to everybody, all of our viewers. Another thank you for you guys. We do it for you. So we love your feedback. And that's it. Another round of the BNH virtual event space is in the books. Catch y'all next time.